Hello, welcome, and thank you all for joining us for today's special launch event for our new talk series, Architecture and You. We are really excited to have you all here with us for what promises to be a unique opportunity to join architects Anna Herringer and Anupama Kundu in a shared conversation. Both Anna and Anupama lead practices whose award-winning projects use the power of design able to balance the needs of people and the planet, which really is at the heart of uh, this talks series, um, making them the perfect speakers to launch it with us. I'm Alan Jones. I'm the uh, president of the RIBA. I'm a professor at Queen's University Belfast, uh, and I practice in Northern Ireland. I'm very much I'm interested in the themes of the whole series and particularly the um, what we're going to be talking about and hearing about today. Architecture Anew is our new public talk series dedicated entirely to sustainability, which of course couldn't come at a better time or a more pertinent, pertinent time. Throughout 2021, it will feature the change makers from across the globe who are already leading the way towards a more sustainable future, embracing social, economic, and environmental concerns. Architecture Anew is part of our ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms, and I would like to thank Vitra Bathrooms by sponsoring this important series. We have opened ticket sales for the next two digital events in April and May, respectively, and we will um, release tickets to the rest of the series soon. The RIBA has declared a climate emergency and we are committed to driving change at a national and international level in industry standards and practice, in government and intergovernmental policy and regulation, and in the RIBA's own carbon footprint. A key element of this work was the launch of the 2030 Climate Challenge. The challenge helps architects meet net zero, or better, whole life carbon for new and retrofitted buildings by 2030. If all RIBA chartered practices meet these targets, they will play their part in addressing this global crisis. I encourage all of you to consider signing up and to do so, you can find out more on our website, architecture.com. I would also add, it was December of uh, last year that RIBA Council agreed on a series of mandatory uh, schedules of knowledge, and that included carbon literacy. So not only for those who sign up, but for all RIBA members, the direction of travel is to be more literate and more expert in carbon literacy and achieving net zero. So to our speakers, so back to tonight's talk, we will begin the event with short presentations by Anna and Anupama respectively, who will outline some of the key ideas behind their work and approach to architecture. I am therefore only going to briefly introduce each of them. Firstly to present will be Anna Herringer. For Anna, Architecture is a tool to improve lives. She has been actively working to support and develop local communities in Bangladesh since 1997. Her commitment to this ethos has seen her win numerable prestigious awards for her projects, including the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2007 for the Meti School in Rudapur, which was actually her student diploma project. Whilst more recently, she was awarded the 2020 Obel Award for the Andaloy Building, um, which hosts a therapy centre for people with disabilities on the ground floor, combined with a fair trade textile manufacturing workshop for local women on the first floor. Anupa Kundu is, a, uh, is on a quest for knowledge about how to build appropriately. She regards time as one of the most valuable things that she can offer in her commitment to an architecture of quality and care that responds to the issues arising from rapid urbanization across much of the world. 
Currently, the work of Anupama's practice has been exhibited as a monographic show in the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark, entitled Taking Time. I absolutely cannot wait to get started. Before we kick off the presentations, I will hand over quickly to the RIBA's Public Programs Manager, who will explain a bit more about this brand new Talks platform uh, that we're using today and how we can make the most of it. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Chloe Spibilo and I work in the Public Programs team here at the RIBA. So since tonight is the first time we have used um, this new Talks platform called Hopin, I thought it'd be really useful to just quickly go through some of the key points about how to use it um, and how we are running tonight's event. So firstly, congratulations. You've all successfully found your way here and to the main event where this talk is currently being streamed. So to the right of, um, of the stream, you can see the chat box, uh, which we would love for you to use and share your comments and questions for our speakers. And this is a really uh, exciting and interesting point. We are in fact going to try a live audience Q&A at the end of the talk, webcams and all. Uh, so please submit your questions for Anna and Anupama using the chat throughout the event for a chance to um, be one of the audience members we select at the end. So we will select a few of these questions and get in touch with you directly via a private um, message function in Hopin. Um, so keep an eye out for that and we will give those who, whose questions have been chosen directions on how to join us backstage. So please bear with us when we get to the Q&As. It's our first time trying this, but we know from your feedback how important being able to offer um, an, a live Q&A and uh, recreate the way we used to do it in person. So we're really giving it a go. And um, so uh, we hope we look forward to having your questions later. So just a note to add that we are recording this event. So all the audience Q&A will be um, part of that recording. And we plan to release the entire series later in the year on our YouTube channels. Uh, another exciting feature, which some of you may have already tested uh, just before we began, was the, is a networking feature. Um, so that is uh, uh, exciting uh, speed dating style feature, uh, which will match you up with other willing audience members uh, for a limit of up to three minutes. So anyone in the pair can leave at any point. So uh, there's no pressure to stay. Uh, but I encourage everyone to give it a go at the end of tonight's event. We leave it open for 15, 20 minutes uh, at the end. And hopefully I'll see some of you there. Uh, the last feature to direct you to is the info zone, which is the last um, button on the left hand side. And this provides some uh, further information on the rest of this series. Also a chance to chat to our sponsors and also a special discount in our RIBA bookshop. Uh, well, that, that's, that's all from me. Um, I'm really, really happy to now be handing over to Anna Herringer to start her slides. Hi, Anna. Hello. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Hello, London. Hello, Onodi. I'm very happy to have this conversation today with you. It's really a, a special bliss. So to me, architecture is a tool to improve lives. And I really firmly believe in that. And I mean, it's also unfortunately the opposite is true. You know, we can architecture is also a tool to destroy lives. But I'm an idealist and I go not one millimeter <laughs> below the ideal because I think the reality sucks <laughs> enough. You know, we have to reach higher. We have to do better. And especially also in our profession, which is unfortunately quite um, contributing to climate change and, and also social injustice. Mm -hmm. No, the slides are. Yeah, that was the picture um, taken at the beginning of 2005 when we started building the METI school. So I had been in that village in Rutupur many years before that. That also helped me building up the trust with the people I felt really at home. And what I had learned before in Bangladesh what, was that the most effective strategy for development is always to use the local existing resources that you have available and try to make the best out of it. And in case of architecture and building, it was the dirt underneath the feet and then the bamboo that was all growing around. And in terms of local energy sources, it was the people. You know, when we think of alternative energy, we always think of solar, wind and so on, but it's also human energy. Craftsmanship is a wonderful source of energy and we have 
more than um, I think 7.8 billion people already. So this is a growing source. And if we don't use the source, we also create a social problem. And of course, it's it's a wonderful thing to see, you know, that that um, the jobs that you create really are a lifesaver for, for families. And what I also really experienced and learned in Bangladesh is that the process is just as important as the outcome. And you also have to design the process and not just the building in order to really and make it a catalyst for, for development. Yeah, this is the METI school that was part of my diploma project. And I had um, joined the forces for the realization with Eike Roswag, a Berlin-based architect. And the ground floor is, you know, a, a really massive load-bearing earth walls, no cement added, just the, the raw earth with, mixed with straw. And through this bolt hole in the wall, you come to the cave areas. And I always try to, you know, when I was designing, I was trying to remember the spaces that I loved when I was a kid. And I think a kid in Bavaria is not so much different from a kid in Bangladesh. I think these are these archaic patterns that we all have kind of engraved in our humane um, memory and in our DNA somehow. And this kind of protective feeling I wanted to bring in that school because the school um, was supposed to be a, a place of joy, a place where children um, really feel feel well and that was the briefing of the architect of Deepshika. So the top, top floor is more the tree house pattern. So you have the overview of the village and the children all signed with the names on the doors of the school and that was important because they were also co-builders of the school and of course this is not something you can do with every material. This is something you know that is unique also with the mud because you can shape the walls just with your hands. You know you don't need any tools that can harm you. The material is wonderful to touch and it's not anyhow toxic. So this was really a fantastic opportunity to bring the users in and, and to bring the community in the process. And I guess you can all imagine how it feels when you're standing then after six months a month in front of, of your school building as a small boy or as a small girl or as an illiterate day laborer who never had the chance to go to a school and then you know you you built this thing with just using your hands and the dirt beneath your feet and that just gives an enormous a normal boost in confidence in your own potentials and in of course in the team around you and in the natural building materials and that was something that was for me essential you know in the beginning as a german i thought i have to bring in the perfect technologies and you know and and do trainings and whatever. But I, I found that the most important thing was to, to raise the trust um, that everything that you need is, is, is already there and you can do it and you can just you know, activate your potentials and create something out of the ordinary. And then the second building followed, that's the Deshi Electrical Vocational Training School, where we tried to bring even more refined craftsmanship in, like the bamboo and more refined mud surfaces. That's the Varanda, that is one of the most favorite places in that village. And that's the last building that just won the Obel Award. That is the Ananda Loy Building, a center for people with disabilities. And while the first buildings, you know, were all very accurate and straight, and that was important at this part because, you know, it was needed to show that you can do proper architecture with mud, with just the dirt around, you know, you can be precise and you can be edgy. And, and it's not just the dirt that you somehow temporarily pile together to form a wall. No, that it's real architecture. But with this building, I wanted to show that it's good that we are not all following the norm and the, that it's good to break out of the mold and to dance and to, you know, to celebrate this diversity. This is what I wanted to express with this architecture. So it's kind of the ramp is kind of uh, winding up around the building and, you know, it's really like <laughs> floating around and it's the only ramp in that area. And already during the construction site, people, came, a, a high number of people came to the site. And the first thing that they asked was, of course, why do we need a ramp? And then immediately you, immediately you are at the discussion, you know, about inclus inclusiveness and why it is important, you know, that everyone has access. Um, and and that was was wonderful to see that architecture has this power to, to bring awareness to, to and, and make things visible that otherwise are hidden. 
that these are the therapy rooms in the ground floor. And that's the, the ramp out of mud and bamboo. And that's the place under the ramp, the caves. And that's a, that's a, a wonderful zone for, for, yeah, for meeting up. You know, it's, it's of course mainly the space for, for the children with disability. And it's, you know, it's a bit linked, you know, if you, you know, you're done with the therapy or you're overhand or whatever, and, and everything is just, you know, you want to have a break, you just escape, you know, you just escape in these cave rooms. And then also, you know, sometimes just other children also try to sneak in. And then this is this whole different universe. It's a, a zone where you can meet up and, and, you know, but they're meeting, you know, they're meeting in the space of, of the children with disabilities. And there's a, you know, there is different rules because it's a different space. It's, it's not the normality in a way, it's not the norm. And it's interesting, you know, how the interactions are in that. And then also, of course, it takes a little effort to, to move in this caves and to crawl through this, which is also good, a good training for, for some of, of the disabilities. And that is the room on the top floor. That is our Dipti Textile workshop and, and studio. And that was something that um, suddenly came to me. You know, when you're so, for such a long time traveling to Bangladesh, you cannot ignore the fact that the most driving um, uh, force for, for settlement patterns in Bangladesh are not architects or city planners or whatever, but it's the, the garment sector, it's the industry. And um, the industry is kind of dragging all the labor forces from the rural areas to some uh, factory hubs. And, and there is just too many people to, to have really humane working conditions or living conditions. And I was always thinking, you know, how is it possible to, you know, bring the work to the people? And that's not possible, you know, with, you know, infrastructure, building more infrastructure, uh, guaranteeing electricity there and, and the roads and everything. That would have been, you know, it's just too enormous of, of, of a project. But I thought, you know, the resources that I have at hand are, is, is, it, is an NGO, Dipshika, who is training um, women in, in tailoring. I have a friend, Veronika Lang, who is a tailor in my hometown in Bavaria. So, and why don't we just get together and design a product that can be, um, can be fabricated in a completely decentralized way? And that's what we are doing. Well, this was a part of, of the Biennale installation in Venice in 2018, where it was, you know, about, you know, to say that we all create spaces, not just as architects, but the way we consume. And often these spaces are so far away that we don't realize it. So we do the same as in architecture. We take the existing resources, the tradition that is there, this kind of um, sari blankets of already used saris. And we do several things. We document our, our buildings. This is the section of the Meiji school, for example. This is the Deshi building, the second building. And this is the master plan of Rudupur, which I love very much. And the blue spots that you see here are the ex excavation parts where, you know, the mud is excavated um, to build these houses here. The green part is the bamboo, you know, that is just growing around the hamlet that is also used for the building. And all these other green parts are the, the you know, the, the paddy fields where, and, and also vegetable fields where you grow your own food. So for me, this is a perfect example of, of, of circular economy and, 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 you know, how you can live a life in, in harmony with nature and your surrounding. And I think there's a lot to learn from that. And of course, we also do um, textiles to wear. That is a project I currently work on, and that also shows a bit the, the way I'm, I'm working or we are working in the studio here. We do a lot of clay storming. It's a little bit like brainstorming, but in a 3D way and, and with real clay. So it's a very intuitive approach. That was the master plan we, we got from Ghana. Um, that was the layout, and that unfortunately is also the layout that is implemented in so many countries around the world. This is kind of a, a heritage from missionary times, development aid times, colonialism, and this is of course something that I would love to break up. And this is what I literally did. I kind of tried to transform this kind of um, masses and, and shape it into uh, settlement patterns that are much more resonating with the traditions there, but of course still in a modern way. So this is kind of the master plan. It's an educational campus with lots of vocational training. 
And this is then going in a bigger scale, you know, that is the School for Sustainable Construction Techniques. And then it goes, you know, it's, it's really how I'm designing. Then from this moment, we put it in the cut then, and then it goes directly to the site and it's implemented just in one-to-one, one -one, but in the same way as, as I, I, it was designed. These are the pictures from the past three weeks. That is a picture of today. So this is the status quo today. And that is Katharina Kolroso, who is just managing the site from my team. And our client, John Bosco from Don Bosco in, in Ghana. The last project I want to show is one of my very favorites. It was um, designed in collaboration with Anka Dürr, Martin Rauch and Sabrina Sommer, who is an interior designer from London and Austria. So. Um, we were invited to build a birth space, so a space for giving birth. Um, it was in collaboration with the Women Museum that had an anniversary in, in Austria. And we had no budget for it. So it was all kind of crowd, crowdfunded from more than 500 private persons mostly, especially women, of course, who thought that is an important topic. And that's interesting that it's kind of such a blind spot. You know, we have spaces for everything, but for giving birth, we go to a hospital and we just, you know, imagine how it is when you come out of the mother's womb, you know, you go, you have this more really dark, cozy warmth, and then usually you go in this kind of super hygienic, white, bright light kind of situation, and, and nothing is, you know, from the materiality that you would like to touch, and and it's in a bed, and normally, you know, uh, giving birth in a bed is not necessarily the the, the natural way. So we thought, you know, what? How would would a space really could look like where you would like to to have your baby be born? And of course, it has had to do something with with a belly. <laughs> so that was kind of already our construction site. So we also had a lot of volunteers helping on the site. It was prefabricated and then put installed on site. And then, because it is Austria, they have a lot of um, this tradition with the shindles, with the wooden shindles. So we put the, the wooden shindles directly in the mud to cover it. And of course, red, you know, originally one we wanted to really color it also with, with blood, <laughs> but that was not, not possible legally. So we had some natural pigments. And that is the team. And we also, it was fascinating the, the level of craftsmanship that the people had there and also to bring in this liveliness and the dynamic. And we also had a garden in front of that space with healing plants, you know, also this old wisdom of what kind of plants are good for women issues, but not only. And then we had a, because it is also a workshop area, we had a fireplace. And then, you know, a place where we could give workshops or it would be also where friends or family would wait. And then, you know, when the baby is born, the doors open, suck, and you come out with the baby. And then, you know, on the door, there would be then all the names of the babies that are born in that space. And since there was not yet a baby born there, we had all the birthdays of every person who volunteered to help building this thing included. That's the space in between. So it's all mud and then Tadalak, this kind of... Um, lime plaster and here you see all the tools and for me that was you know that happened um during that um you know it was last summer so where we all kind of were in the midst of the pandemic and that also gives you a lot of time to to reflect you know will 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 we kind of um give birth to a new awareness also you know is it is it is it just continuing in the way as usual or are we are we learning something? And um, my hope, I would say, is is also that um, we bring in also more more the female qualities. Of course, this is a very female project, but also more female qualities in architecture. You know, for me, it is like it's so often about conquering, about higher, faster, better. You know, bigger, and then this kind of your conquering, exploiting element in architecture is something that. 
I see very problematic. And I think we have to come more towards a, a more nourishing thing, you know, seeing what is there, you know, seeing the resources and, and then kind of facilitating the growth of these things. And that needs patience. You know, we are, one of whom talks about time later. So it's, you know, to give things time, to nourish it and, and also to, you know, sometimes I'll, I also the size doesn't matter. I mean, for me, those small projects are like acupunctural trigger points. You know, you you find the right the right topics, and they can really radiate and have a bigger impact sometimes than the big the big ones. And and uh, this is just my wish that we come towards you know an architecture that not just follows function or parametrics or something like this. But I mean, to me. Um, you know, I was lately asked, you know, how would you, how do, would you end this sentence, you know, form follows. And I, the first thing that came to my mind was um, form follows love. You know, if we do things with empathy towards the resources, towards the, the context, the society, the people you work with, and of course the users, then I think it's automatically sustainable. And for me, it's also, you know, it's um, love is also a formal expression of, or, or beauty is a formal expression of love. And, and I think, you know, that is something we, you don't talk about this in architecture. That is kind of, you can take, talk about everything. You can talk about sex, but not about love. But I think it's important that we bring this empathy also back to architecture. And that would be my hope for, for the coming generations of architecture, but also of, of the coming years, because we unfortunately have to be fast to change the world. And, you know, one, one of my, yeah, my, my favorite quotes, I would say, is, is from Gandhi, who, who is like in a gentle way, you can shake the world. So with this sentence, I would, I would love to end and hand over to my dear friend, Onapuma. I'm looking very forward to see your presentation. Thank you. I'll try to get my screen up first. Oh God. It's, sorry, it opened at some, okay. So hello everyone and thank you RIBA for having us here. Thank you, Alan. Um, I hope you can see the first slide. I'm a bit insecure. Everything okay? So I'll proceed. Um, I, I mean, Anna ended with um, the sentence of we need to hurry up and I would like to take it from there. So I've been called, I've mentioned time as a resource and the need for slow architecture. So I definitely want to clarify here that faced with rapid urbanization, as it's being called, everybody seems to be in a hurry. And what I'm trying to say is not to delay things by uh, through the word, term slow architecture. I would like to rather say that let us not, especially when faced with urgency, let us not cut back on that required time that is needed for thinking. We need to invest even more time to think before we act. Because 30 years ago, by the way, I started my practice three decades ago. In this, uh, I graduated in Bombay. I used, I'm from Bombay. And I grew up in this kind of context where um, the cities everywhere, especially in Bombay, was getting unlivable. And every architectural project that was created was adding to one half of a socially segregated and a thing we don't even question anymore and creating more and more polarity. And 
one thing we can agree upon, nobody found it livable. So having saved on so much time, you know, I, I used to ask myself, this is a quote from Peter Drucker, who said, uh, you know, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. So this was my mood. Uh, I liked the way he had expressed it. But with that in mind, I felt that first and foremost, I should stop doing anything. I don't want to do things uh, and be part of the problem. I'd rather pause. And uh, even if I don't find the appropriate office to start my practice in, I thought I'll just start it myself. And that's how I began my practice. And uh, first, I, during the very adventurous and pioneering years, I dropped out of Bombay, took a lot of time to think and to do nothing, but to do the thing I do very consciously and very thoughtfully. And, and this is an approach I would suggest that could lead to a time and a lifetime that is well spent where we are not rushing about, but we can directly feel enriched and fulfilled. And if everybody acts from that type of a space, then I think already we we create a very different kind of um, not only architecture, but we create a different world, inner world and outer world. So this is my first hut built with round wood for myself. I had to be addressing issues of affordability first and foremost to manage to not become a wage slave and my, liberate my own life. At the same time, I, I, I could prove that a life of beauty doesn't have so much to do with how much a thing costs and the material cost and so on. It is the way you craft the material, whatever it is you have and whatever it is you can afford. So now I would like to mention something about urban materiality. When I talked to, showed you the first slide, I, I feel that architecture purpose lies in the nothingness in in the in the void that you actually design but i realize that for for our times it is the materiality the urban materiality which is actually in uh, the biggest problem of our times and that has to be so radically rethought that one had to take a liberated time um you know that i managed to carve out for myself and start getting to the root of materiality and as i explored all kinds of materials. And I tried to go back to the way bricks are made, how uh, lime is made, how the entire topography, how territory and economy and community and the making of materials, the sourcing of materials, how did this operate pre-industrial times when things were hand sourced and post-industrial time? And I started realizing that the interesting approach to take would be to not look at materiality just from the point of view of materials in a cold-blooded way like the green rating system we have, but rather to look at the human, how is the human hand, the human mind, and the human being's advancement affected by the way materiality is considered. And I realize that the human scale is one thing to be salvaged first and foremost, because the machine scale took over. And, uh, you know, you can see what happens when you, you cannot just say a stone is good or bad, but when you don't have the noise of the Italian quarries and the machines, and you can live next to the village and take your stone out. I mean, there's something to do with the human and how well the human being is doing in the midst of all this. And I realized um, to add one more thing to what Anna said, form follows technology is what I felt because it was a technological choice that led to um, a lot of imbalance. And I felt that a lot of um, uh, alternative work, you know, I was so frustrated being called alternative always uh, instead of just being called an architect. I realized that a lot of alternative work that I did, uh, you know, because I started seeing what they found different in what I did. I was actually applying engineering and I was influenced by mostly modernism and Black Mountain College, uh, Bauhaus, all the people who had radically experimented. And I felt we have to continue this kind of spirit of experimentation. And I produced architecture with whatever I found around me and noticing that the luxury and the quality of space 
and all those habitual um, uh, decision, unconscious decisions that people make have to do with not uh, anything but perhaps laziness and perhaps not thinking for themselves and in uh, growing up in an over standardized world becoming uh, so standardized oneself that one is not thinking even not thinking for oneself and just doing repeating habits that one sees and no wonder that 30 years later i have not everybody was in such a hurry i see what have we changed we have built a lot more ugly buildings just more rapidly and i i really ask myself what are we doing with all the time that we are trying to save in the modern lifestyle we we are, we are trying to flatter buildings and decisions when we we take we save time and we we give it a certain kind of praise you know or or we call it design efficiency but have we done something better with the time we saved or are we even more stressed so this was that's the reason i want to reflect on time and i'm just walking i don't want to explain projects because i explored all kinds of materials uh, pre industrial bricks lime mortar little bit of cement so that we could be uh, not as slow as lime uh, needs to set but a little uh, initial setting strength it was all very technical what i did it was very embedded in engineering and material research I experimented with all kinds of things what i found i i i looked at craftsmen i looked at what they have and i critically examined it for example got potters to make uh, roofing units or i these are ferro cement louvers there you see potters were losing jobs um, their livelihood actually and i th due to urbanization and i felt that in fact urbanization could guarantee further work to them and they could get better paid so it was not a patronizing approach actually from my side not because of any um sense that i'm going to help all these local communities and so on but i just found this kind of buildings more, much more intelligent look they are doing the terracotta firing with coconut shells we are producing loss shuttering for a very efficient concrete in which through this kind of form work we are producing 40% steel savings so these are these were you know all these techniques were applied say this is wall house this is my second house 10 years later because i did this only to test the terracotta ideas actually look the house is very empty i was very used to living with nothing so i i really wanted to explore every possible material uh to be ready for the future and to have a new palette where you can use engineering to radically reduce the quantity of materials improve the quality and improve the knowledge uh, not only in my own head but also um that everybody involved um could contribute and collaborate you know this this project the wall house was shown in venice biennale um so some of you will remember it from there and i tried to this is the kind of dialogue i wanted to have where again talking about time in the context of what was in the past what is our legacy what is our heritage every time humans die they leave their architecture behind we colonize that so is our current architecture colonizable or do we have to build a new thing every time for each one who's born or whoever migrates and question all of that so i actually had in david chipperfield's biennale um that he curated i put the wall house into a venetian context to explain that the future ideas and the past ideas don't have to stand in conflict there is no duality inside the time um um in the way we look at time past the present is just nothing but a passage of a through a large continuum and there are improvements you can see the roof how they built it sorry and the way they built their walls and you know those who want to understand the techniques they will know what was what was introduced to use much less material with more knowledge gained so these are some other images which show the kind of work i do where i'm trying to seek a kind of relationship and porosity um between the inside and the outside you know for buildings that breathe yes even in terms of modern climate control those of you who saw my wallpaper cover design will know what i'm talking about 
Um, and here are other examples of buildings. This is a daycare center. And this was for, for making uh, children from very difficult backgrounds feel very secure in an institutional building. And here I've used industrial terracotta units. So I'm all the time designing what is the extent to which I want to negotiate handmade with machine made and so on, and how to design the social sustainability strategies alongside environmental and economic ones. So I'm just uh, going to run through some buildings. This is another co-housing project with rammed earth where I discovered that people's time is a huge asset. And can we absorb that? Um, and get out of the tyranny of housing, if, if even in urban context, you know, if we can unleash some of the time people have, and they could cut back on their loans and so on. So I am very much into the idea of co-housing and sharing and that type of economy. These projects were done in Oroville um, almost 18 years ago. Um, and you can see some of the material research uh, expressing itself in different ways. I've done a lot of research in concrete as well and ferrocement. Those of you who saw the BBC or heard the BBC uh, climate question about concrete and its future, I, I have been part of that panel. And we, these are examples of reinforced concrete building that that use significantly less amounts of concrete through the clever engineering, but also working on the materiality of the concrete itself. So this is the town hall complex. And then I'm now working a lot with ferro cement where I'm trying to radically reduce the amount of reinforcement by using only chicken mesh and to build very, very thin buildings. These are prefabricated toilet blocks that can be installed in a day. And uh, taking up from the research from uh, of uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi, working ferro cement with much more, uh, even more lightness than that. These are modules for housing. This is called Fulfill Homes. It's a project that I um, also showed in the 2016 Venice Biennale. So these are uh, just to give you an idea that uh, a lot of time invested in developing the knowledge that with which we could come up with a whole new palette of building materials from in every material, whether it's a vernacular one or a new materiality that we're exploring. There is such a potential to significantly reduce the consumption and deliver many more square meters, square feet in uh, with those materials. So my um, the focus of my work is uh, in, it starts from the fact that what is yet to be known about the world is so much more than what we already know. And that's why it's future driven. And that's why I put a lot of emphasis on building knowledge and building community as a process to build the knowledge. So this is a, a, a project called Baked in Situ Mud Houses. It's a home, it's a homes for homeless children, all built in earth and then cooked in situ like a kiln after stuffing it with bricks so that the heat of the uh, bricks that uh, you know the, the kiln walls absorb 40 percent of the heat we tap it and cook a house with that so i mean here you don't even need cement because fire is your cement so these are just um, another area of material research where i'm building with books with anything you find you know uh, in the same exhibition that anna showed anna showed just now um um you know she and me had participated in museum museo eco in madrid and i have been exploring uh, say these books for example as a material that is urban waste and it gets burnt and pulped i've made a lot of things with such things you know such unconventional building materials to just have some fun also with students and to realize that if you can build and look at a book in a new way, you'll go back and look at a brick in a new way. So it's it's something I do very much in the studio where I just take anything, doesn't matter what, and tell them, how would you build with that? The idea is not to say now the future buildings will be made with books or now with chai class, glasses that are cracked or using bicycle wheels for form work. The idea is that rethink, rethink. The think is important and rethink is important. And the material is just incidental. It could be anything. Through that process, in a few days like this in Mexico, you know, people, we've, we've stuffed the uh, Tetra Pak back with sand and water and experimented how you can build. Or here you see that I'm 
making this ferro cement so light that I can cast it on paper with so little mesh. So denim waste, installation for water bottles to be distributed in the event. But finally, I want to end with this project um, where I'm also, because I showed you the big context of um, Bombay, I have also been working on, um, I, I, many of my projects are located in Oroville, which is a city that was designed called the city the earth needs to be able to rethink, um, rethink cities for the future. 50 years ago, it was uh, founded in India. And I had the very good uh, fortune to work 17 years alongside, live here and collaborate with Roger Angers on the master plan and all aspects from ownership of land to mobility, everything was radically rethought in his design. Here I'm uh, discussing with Jan Gale um, in a University of Stuttgart where I'm teaching where some of these new, very high rise, uh, I mean, very dense uh, housing projects are located co-housing projects of the future with new mobility, et cetera. So I'm, uh, you know, working on a also very big scale of planning and urban design because as a Bombayite, I don't think we can manage to go further if we only look at materials nostalgically, but I also want to apply my knowledge for the very high density aspect to keep the footprint very low so that our food and forests, et cetera, can be saved. So the tug of war between density and development on one hand and environment on the other is a is the challenge of the future so this is where oroville is at this is a youth hostel that i have done there oroville is already a real project i just wanted to add and i'll end with a few images of my exhibition of taking time there 30 years of my work has been displayed i'm just running through a few images so that you get a sense and maybe you still have the time to go there. Um, May 16th uh, is, I think, the closing date. And yes, there's a Wunder Kama in the middle where, you know, how I look at the universe, how I discover the architecture of time. And then all around, there are different material palettes from of six different material groups and uh, research done. And there are models and outcomes of those uh, quests and uh, you there are uh, like for example you see on the wall here that there, there are models showing the spatial research in 1 to 50 scale as a very different research than the material research and the architecture is the coming together of those two through engineering so this is what you'll get to see if you go there 1 to 5 scale details 1 to 50 scale projects and 1 to 50 scale urban design of that new housing and one to one scale of the future facade in the high rise which includes power generation uh you know from solar photovoltaics integration of urban waste um keeping the human scale intact even if it's high rise keeping it slow and horizontal in the mobility and making uh looking at designing the porosity the inside outside relationships the urban farming and so on so with that i would like to end my presentation and to say that yes i think architecture has an incredible potential to provide a more livable life and to liberate our time so that we have a more fulfilled time on this earth life is short so let's have a better quality thank you that was wonderful i really enjoyed it i remember when i first saw you talking and you were you had a belly bump like this because i think it was your your due date was i think like two days later or something like this and i was i just had designed the meta school and i think maybe started building it and i were was you, have you already graduated anna i'm glad you remind me i know my son is now 14 almost 15 so yeah it was just that 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 kind of so yeah. i was sitting in the audience and I was seeing you on stage and I was thinking, my God, what a woman. I, I remember the first, particularly the first project that you showed today, that got so much stuck in my mind and I was so impressed. And that was also really very motivating for me to see, you know, this 
powerful woman on stage and you were supposed to be a mother and you were unstoppable somehow. Yeah, that, that was two days, two days before my delivery. I had to give a lecture in Berlin at the TU, right? Okay. To, to the yeah. And I remember that, uh, I mean, I know Anna since uh, before she shot to fame, of course. And um, so we have a, we know each other. And she she knows my roots. We speak Bangla sometimes. Yeah. And I speak, I, I'm working in her country. I, I'm here. You're the only person with whom I can sh switch from, from German to Bengali and English. So yes. it's always very funny, depending if we want yeah. to, that people understand us or not, we, we switch the color, uh, the language. Yeah, I, I mean, in the first chat for all the Bengalis out here, on the talk, she Anna has written hello Anudi, bhalo acho, <laughs> and I replied zay good undu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you Anna. Lovely work, and to see same your same. recent projects. Same, well same. Done. Always inspiring. So, oh no, in, in this fifteen years, you know, when I first met you, <laughs> so what has changed for you? You know, you you. You don't seem to, to be tired or frustrated. You know, you're in the same level of energy. How do you keep that level? How do oh you keep God. that energy? Anna, I, I have seen a lot of uh, difficult life, you know, since uh, behind the happiness that I try to enjoy uh, is the fact that I grew up and saw a lot of difficulties in my own and lives of others. I've seen a lot of misery and suffering. And I think the best response to that is by trying to enjoy what you can. And when you do whatever you can um, enjoy little things, I think it unleashes some energy, you know. And of course, what changed in 15 years is that uh, I have two children and I'm more a mother. So, you know, I have to juggle a little more things. But um, but but not much has changed. I would say, not much has changed. I try. I have the same aspirations and the same. Um, I just have more clarity, and I don't. I all the more I'm determined, and I am very calm because. Yeah, I'm much more at home in the way I'm managing. That's wonderful. I mean, I have. I think you you're a bit similar to me. It's like even if you're exhausted and tired, when you start talking about the communities and you're empathically zoom yourself in the communities, kind of you recharge the batteries. Or it's like I have the feeling, you know, if I would do the work just, you know, for my own ego, I would not have this energy to. You know, I I think I have to maybe if if we talk more on that personal level rather than architecture, I would say that uh, what helped me to unleash energy is that um, I learned very early on in in when I faced massive difficulties all around, you know, of all sorts. You know, I realized that you don't achieve anything if you give attention to the problem and let it overwhelm you. And I, the moment you can find anything around you, any little thing, a flower, if you can zoom into anything that is beautiful and you can just get into that space, then remain there and then you can even solve the problem. Mm, that's, that's the way I took it forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I, I remember when I was, you know, this 15 years ago and I was doubting, you know, if my designs are good enough to be implemented and so on. And, but I had the feeling, you know, things were coming into pieces, you know, there was a team was formed, you know, and people started to say, well, we support your project we, with the nations and so on. And I felt, you know, I personally didn't feel ready to build the Metis school because I was too insecure. You know, I, I, I got a B grade for my diploma, you know, for this design. And I was like, I didn't know it looked so simple to me. And I didn't know, you know, if it's, you know, intellectual enough, if it's, you know, sophisticated enough and everything. So I, I would not have thought, I, I would not have the power for myself to stand there and say, you know, we're going to do this thing. But I felt, you know, I, I can't pull the brake now because this village needs the school, you know, and suddenly I felt, you know, because there were so many people who needed this thing, it felt it like a power from the back, you know, or an energy from the back, you know, that just pushed me in this thing. And that's what I feel, you know, 
and with every challenge, you also get the energy to go through this thing. And and the more you know, you you kind of work for for you know communities that need the thing, the more you you know you get this energy to do that. I, I yeah. don't think that I would have this energy for a single family house. I have to admit, also you know families are important, but but it's something else. Yeah. Do you feel, uh, I mean, uh, did you feel that coming from Germany and working in India, I'm just like in Bangladesh and the other way around, would you feel that it's more accepting like of you, let's say, when you work there, when, you know, do, do you feel, ex did you feel accepted and did that give you some confidence to some extent? Uh, or, you know, can you speak about that? Because I keep getting asked it the other way around and how, you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not very easy because there's a lot of pigeonholing and, you know, how people are perceived across nations. For instance, um, I, I found it very intriguing that when uh, when people from our half of the world travel to anywhere in the developed countries, OK, we are called migrants, OK? And even if you go for work, but when the British guy goes to my country, he's called a expat, you know? Yeah. It's very different how we are yeah. treated, you know. And, and even worse, you know, you're the volunteer hero. <laughs> that that was in the beginning. It was a disaster, you know, that this tone and in, in, in sometimes. What do you mean? Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, you know, it was like, oh, this giving the time, you know, going and teach and teach people, you know, somewhere else and how to better build. This was like. Yeah, it can be, disaster. it can be patronizing, right? Yes, and it was a disaster because I never felt like this. I really felt part of this community there. I really right. felt like this is my home. This is, <laughs> and um, and it's it's very important for me now. Also, you know, for several years I was just working in in and not only working but also learning in in Bangladesh. And it was so you know, I just loved it so much. I didn't even think to 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 work in in my context. But now I understand that I also have to bring this know how back, you know, to the European context, because you know the difference here when when you work in Bangladesh or in you know in Ghana, whatever, it's always solution seeking. You know, you always try to find solutions, and right. you can act out of common sense logic. You know, you just and and always the more sustainable um, um, solution is always the cheapest one. Well, when you work in Europe, the most sustainable one is the most expensive one, which drives me nuts, really makes me extremely angry. And that means also, you know, that our economic system really sucks. It's like, you know, it's when, a, when an economic system is supporting materials that make a harm to the environment, you know, where money is kind of monopolized and, 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 and kind of cumulated in, in a few places and, you know, not fairly distributed. And, and while you could just use local materials, ex exactly also here in Europe, I mean, we have the dirt underneath our feet everywhere. Also, you know, you dig a, a new metro line, you have the dirt that is the building material. You know, now we dump it somewhere. You know, it's, it's not just a matter of developing countries, but we really need a lot of, you know, political will to change the framework, to make it again possible to, to build in that way, in this common sense logic. And we have lost that tremendously. And I find it really problematic. So I hope, you know, that we are learning a lot from, from this common sense logic again. And this is, I mean, it's, it's a hell lot of work. It's like here, it's always, when, when we discuss here, when we have our, our weekly meetings, it's always a kind of um, problem seeking. You know, you always look where could be, where could be a, an insurance problem, where could be a hidden risk, where could be, you know, and then you end up that your designs are kind of shaped by insurance's logic and lobbyism and not from the common sense logic. And that really makes me angry. And that's why it's very hard for me to work in this context. And, and always really a relief to work in, 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 in countries like, like Bangladesh, Ghana, and so on. So actually, I was very, I'm very happy you addressed that question because that was my second question to you, that whether you struggle to have the, that same type of practice, because I used to see, see a lot of work that even often it gets ex exoticized up, you know, the picturesque architecture in those countries, poor countries. And, you know, I mean, there's so many, we can list, there were many critical articles even on, in some of the good journals about that. And I wonder if, 
one should not have a discussion on on how is it for people who are who like to build this like for yourself um you know to actually work in your own country and in your own context and what could be the difficulties that you face but also not only the fact that you may not agree with the kind of um work that people favor you know but i think there is more than the norms and so on i think that that would be a very good discussion we can't solve answers here but i think somebody should really take that up as a whole conference topic or a whole uh, issue of some magazine to be dedicated you know because there is a still a colonial sort of way of looking at architecture and uh, you know this is a bit irritating for me personally totally I yeah, and really it should be, and yeah. and I, I really I, I I remember in the beginning, you know, when I did the talks, then it was oh she's doing such nice work, and it's far away, and luckily it's far away, you know, and then when I started to talk, you know, we should also implement these strategies here, you know, and that time it was like ah it's unrealistic, and it was like you know I stopped getting awards and so on it was really interesting as we talking about awards congratulations i see the list of awards you've got and the recent obel award um 15 years uh, what i can say 15 years later you've got quite a huge uh, list of accomplishments so congratulations to we are lucky huh? <laughs> good so yeah so um i don't know how much time do we when do we go on or how with the chat with others or is there any other question between I, us i would like to know you know for you it seems that the process you know and being on the site and developing mock ups with with the craftsmen and experimenting with with materials and the model works and and so on that this is a very essential part of your design the same is for me you know it's like sometimes you don't draw anything you know you just build the one to one detail you know on site and then it gets copy you know or you just yeah. put on the site develop it, things and how do you incorporate this in in your teaching in germany actually i uh, i have to uh, correct there because it's it may look like that but mine is highly uh, in the old school way you know yeah. i i come from a, a school of architecture jj school of architecture in bombay which in fact was a riba affiliated school yeah uh, where minet de silva also graduated there were very few schools then of course you know i have to also use the chance to say because this is in london that rudyard kipling uh, was born on my campus on our campus because his father was the dean of that school anyway so we were given a very classical education and i am very grateful for that because that knowledge from that school has served me everywhere to teach and to do anything everywhere in the world in fact and i am on the contrary to what it appears i highly technically draw everything hundreds of times of models done in all kinds of scales in addition i also do the on site thing parallel i i do both there are things i do bottoms up like the material samples and the things you do i always start with the material palette and i start enquiries so i also do urban design type thing so i have both the scales and i always look for the synthesis you know some models are made in the classical architectural way and the material research merge together with the spatial research at some point but i i definitely uh, do lots of drawing i think it's even more and some of my projects like those ferro cement things they they can be built in a week they can be built in a in a day some of them but it may have taken me 4 years to come to that stage then i also beyond the site i do a lot of lab testing i work with engineers i'm working on the materiality i need to understand what the mesh does what the cement does and i'm constantly learning about that and i'm also constantly learning from people of other professions and do you, you know? do this with your students as well yes <laughs> they also do uh, yeah i i do that because what i try to do is like for example in germany what i'm doing right now is um you know there's this whole problem that i'm i have raised in um in uh, this wallpaper issue this uh, shumi boss who's going to join us here i think hope maybe with a question she has uh, written a, a piece on me which i was so happy to read because i feel understood in the way she's written it and but i've also done the cover design for wallpaper and i have raised the issue that most concerns me about european or let's say you know our kind of 
work here. And it's the question of how we do building insulation, how we assume climate has to be controlled. Nobody is supposed to open the window. Somebody in some call center is going to tell us uh, how to operate. So we are not going to breathe. Thank God COVID happened and we have to fight for breathing now. But there is a big problem, material and form, um, material shapes form, but even in the materiality, there is voids actually to breathe and porosity. And that porosity is a from the room to the material, it's a continuous uh, breathing, you know. There was there, every, every beehive, every nest, everybody insulates by breathing. So wh what are we doing here with this kind of 100% insulation? For what is it even good? You just trap the old air. I don't know. I'm, I'm making my students question everything. That's what I think academia is for. Academia is not here to just give information and repeat, repeat, repeat. Have the guts to look at what there is not yet the knowledge for. And the second thing is the knowledge that is established there also in the scientific knowledge, there are open questions, right? They always conclude in the end. That's the one we have to take up. We are not here to teach only the known. My God, where will we go like that? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so Chloe or someone, should we keep saying us? <laughs> should we no. keep discussing or yes? Hi, both. Um, I think this is a good time to bring in um, audience questions. I've been tr tr <laughs> typing away at the back end to try and get them teed up. Um, and I, so we have some great questions from, I'm hoping to get Julia on screen and also Shumi, as, as you mentioned, Annie Palmer. Um, so Shumi is here, um, but before I bring her on, I wanted to just say uh, we've got some brilliant comments coming through that I just wanted to share um, with you both because I know you can't see them we're in our backstage area um, so as I and I've just picked some here so apologies I haven't got everyone's but we've got wonderful and meaningful designs I love your ethos um, appreciating this so much all ages non-toxic inclusive architecture for human optimism exclamation mark children can be participants and citizens now not just in the future um, so that was in reference to Anna's slides a good hat and good boots is a key adage for the longevity of earthen building. Sure. Um, I love the use of terracotta. Uh, someone here is has lived in one of the buildings in Oroville, which is you know brilliant to have you join us. Um, and great ideas, great projects. What a fabulous contribution you're both making. And we look forward to many more ideas coming to fruition. Um, so we also have a few um, quite a, a few technical questions. And so I thought I might just ask those um, before we then go to Shumi um, to ask her, her some broader question. Um, so we've got a few questions on some of the projects shown. So um, in, re in relation to Anna's projects, you've got a question from Rachel Foster. How long do these structures last and how does the ground need to be prepared specially for them in any way to prevent sub subsidence? <laughs> subsidence. So the mud is super durable. I mean, there have been now, it was 2005 when we built the Metis School and now every year there's harsh monsoon rains hitting the walls in a horizontal way and there is absolutely no problem. The bamboo, with the bamboo we had to learn, you know, I came from a place where there was no bamboo and I did terrible mistakes. I, I took the nice green one because it looked like bamboo, you know, like you, you think from the German perspective how bamboo should look like. And, you know, that was, there was too young, full of sugar, beetles came, had to be replaced. It was a total disaster. You know, I thought, my God, this is just one Yaga Khan award. Now I have to dismantle everything. It's not working. I was, couldn't eat anymore, couldn't sleep anymore. Went on the plane to Bangladesh and the workers were on a relax, you know. We have the know-how, we know how to do, we just need the bamboo, you know, we can replace it easily. What happened was, you know, we we became more clever we 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 planted our own bamboo now so we can replace it easily the old tribe of of, of workers kind of um passed on the know-how to younger colleagues which was important and what i understood that that normally you know it's all about durability durability but in fact we are a waste society you know we we try to build with them 
with the steel, with the concrete and the more, the better, whatever. But in fact, you know, we tear our buildings down after 40 years and that's a problem. So we should actually build in a decompostable way. And what's much more important is that the know-how remains, you know, not the waste, but the know-how that you can rebuild with the natural ma local existing materials. And that what happened now with the third building, you know, the, the no knowledge is completely anchored in, in that village. I, I was there only in the beginning. And then when the building was, was done and someone from my team, Stefano was there in, when, when the roof came there, that was all, but they did the entire site completely on their own. That means, you know, the know-how is really there. And also the maintenance is fantastic. So. That's, that's for me really important. Thank you so much. So I think that is probably a good time now to go to bring Shumi in to ask her question. And it's working, you're on mute. I can see Shumi, so you might have to, there we go. Welcome. Hello. Shumi, come on us and. Hello, Shumi, you say, Namaskar. Really, really enjoyed this um, watching you to speak to each other is quite rare to see architects kind of really flowing in discussion with each other and I know you have a long relationship so that's been really gratifying to watch um, I've been lucky enough to know uh, Anu for when was 2012 yeah almost 10 years um, <laughs> um, but, and I've heard so much from both my students and from her about you Anna so really wonderful to see you both in conversation Speaking of my students, some of whom I know are here, um, you know that this question is for you, right? Just checking. So the question is whether um, Anupama and Anna, both of you, whether you could reflect on the use of materials. You've both spoken about materiality, whether that's you know traditional, local, uh, however you'd like to describe it. But I guess what I'm asking about is the perception of materialities. I'll tell you why. I mean, I went to see a building in a timber frame building in, in France. It was a building made for um, students from India. Um, it's in the in the kind of university area of Paris. And um, it was a timber frame building. And the architects did kind of remark on the fact that timber frame buildings and traditional materials aren't so well regarded often in the global south because there's there's different perceptions. Then, of course, I know your work from experiencing it at, say, Venice, where there's an audience that is attuned to a certain kind of appreciation. So I wanted um, to know if you had any, if you were able to reflect on how those perceptions vary depending on your audiences, you know, whether you're talking to the local contractors, how do they react when you say, I want to use mud? And uh, versus, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. That that is true. I mean, they have a very bad branding, you know, like it's the poor, poor people's material, the mod, you know, it's the most modest one. But I think, you know, architecture is a very powerful tool. You know, we have the beauty, <laughs> you know, that we can make it really look super beautiful. So I I completely respect the fact that the, the people want to have a building they can be super proud of. So I'm giving my very best in the design to give them the building, you know, they aspire. And I think, you know, the challenge is to prove that you can build with a super old material, with a super traditional material, still in a modern way. And that it's not a matter how old and traditional the material is, but it's our creative ability to use it in, in a way that it meets the, the needs and aspirations of the people. Yeah, I think I would like to add, Shumi, that uh, the way I look at it is like if you were to look at a chef's work, okay, in a contemporary thing, you're not going to say, look, he used a vernacular material. Like in, in my case, which when, when people say that my work is vernacular, which it is clearly not, um, in the sense, not that to judge the term, but what I mean is people see a material and they, in today's world, they pigeonhole it okay which is which is only happening among the intelligentsia i mean the middle people not the very clever and not the normal the rest of the world who are not in the incestuous architectural circle they don't have any such issues in their head this is just the, in the mind of the few people who are uh, trained in the five years of architectural education to have very strong opinions based on photographs and god knows what but the point is if you were to look at the, the the when when I've worked in and I've worked in very with various materials, I actually if I don't come there with a doubt, I haven't found the doubt in anyone, neither in a client nor in a contract or whatever, because they follow the architect, right? So if I look hesitant, they will 
look hesitant because that's what I'm radiating. If I look confident and excited, so if they ask me when they are scared, I tell them very openly that these are the risks. I don't promise some utopia, okay? I'm not that type. I tell them, listen, I believe in this. I'm offering this because this is the best I can come up with to spend your money. If you, if you like it, there is a risk involved, but this is what you can gain. And what is the, please see the risk of the alternative. If you take a conventional material, it's 100% bad. So do you want to take a 50% chance of being good? Usually people are clever, you know, they, they go like for it. it. <laughs> I like your approach, owner. This is and really what, beautiful. Yes, and also what the chefs do. See, when you go and have a contemporary cuisine, they source from the local material, local farmer and everything. You don't call that thing traditional just because they use the local cabbage. Come on. They shouldn't do that to architects. Well, so I think like that's interesting. I mean, I guess I was asking about these kind of material perceptions, but what we're getting into is, I guess, a slightly fetishistic quality that sometimes people have when talking about places they don't know. Anu, I've had the luck to talk to you for hours. Anu, have you experienced this with your work? Have you ever found your work to be fetishized or discussed in a way that makes you uncomfortable? Or is it all good? Yeah. I mean, especially, you know, I had I had one situation where a representative of, of the cement industry was sitting there and I was, you know, giving my very, you know, emphatic talk and, you know, played oye for, for the clay. And then he was like, uh, do you really think this could be ever be a reality? And I was thinking, hey, guy, there are more people living in earthen houses than in cement. So shut up. You know, of course, it's possible to scale up. You know, it's just, you know, get out of my way. Here. Did you actually say shut up? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I was too polite that time. Now I will probably say that. <laughs> well, thank you both for being so candid um, generally tonight. Uh, so, yeah, but that's, that's all I, I'm sure that. I hope my students are now brave enough to ask their own questions. I tried, right? So you can step up now. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shumi. Thanks so, so much. So um, I'm hoping that Julia might um, be on her way. Um, Richard, do let me know when she if she's in the stream. Not here at the moment. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a shout when she arrives. Well, um, I might read out her question. Um, then because it is just brilliant, uh, which is why I was really keen for her to get involved. Um, so Julia Glanville has said, uh, I would love to know how and if Anna Herringer and Anu Palmer can do are continuing in a way where Hassan Fatih left off and also whether they um, uh, are inspired by the work of Salma Sama Dam Luji. Um, do you yeah, know any of those? Yeah, all, you know, they are all, pioneers of course that that had opening up the way and and bring the awareness that these materials are existing at all and this was a very important step so but um well personally i i you know my my orientation is is always in 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 the villages you know this this is where i'm taking my my inspiration from you know this is this is and and of course the pioneer work is is an important one and and um, especially taking, you know, the archi architecture, not just as a formal endeavor, but also as a social endeavor, what Hassan Fatih did, I think that was an very important, especially also during that time. I think uh, what I would like to say is that since I started very early on uh, and, uh, you know, when you face rejection, you become really, when you start feeling comfortable with that, it's actually a very good thing because that makes you not want to please anybody. You don't have to please people. You just feel very comfortable in being irrelevant. That's my case, okay? Being insignificant. And then you start knowing where you can be significant as well. And I think that 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 the, it, that the confidence came from really uh, not overvaluing my work or not, uh, you know, just taking it as it is. Just genuinely, sincerely, not going by what others think about it. Uh, yes, we need to think about it, other people's money. But what I mean is not trying to please anyone. I, I mean, uh, you know, or, or whatever, these uh, accomplishments, these awards, this whatever it is, you know, the, the press. I personally lived in a very 
far away spot and i was totally cut off i didn't do any of those things you know and that was my best protection because i created a lab lab situation for myself and i am in that lab you know i know i know if even if someone praises me i remain grounded i know what are my questions i know where i still have to work you know so i just contextualize my work in that larger genuine questions that i have you know so thank you so much and i mean another reason why i loved julia's question was that so there's a sort of small extension to it and um she brings the topic and i know this is something you picked up on in your slides anna um to to bring the way you practice and the way those um precedent architects have practiced to to support um trans and interdisciplinary um uh peoples and um in terms of your work from a feminist economist perspective um, and how you see your work in relation to that. So, sorry, <laughs> I didn't fully get the question, sorry. Sorry, that's my mumbling. Um, so no, no, an extension no. to Julia's, no, no, an extension to Julia's question, I haven't really phrased it properly. Um, so she wants to know, an extension to her first question about those precedent um, architects, um, is there a sort of feminist economist, I guess, uh, approach to your both your work? I think, you know, my feeling is that, or let's put it like this, when I was walking with my former partner, I could also walk on the construction site in, in, you know, during the village, whatever, then he was constantly complaining, you know, you cannot cross the site because you have to stop every three minutes and, and talk to a person for two minutes, you know, and, and, but we have to get this job done. And I thought, you know, but you know, it's so important to talk to the people because you know they they need to be part of it and you just can't you know you just can't pass without asking how the family is doing you know and it and i felt like and i felt it in in many team works you know that that the process and how you achieve the aim you know and is something a, a very female approach you know it's not just about this beautiful object in the end but also how to get it there, you know, the, and so the process is just as important as the outcome. And I, I felt that this is something, you know, that um, we don't talk enough about it, about the process. We always talk about the shiny pictures in the end, you know, and 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 the intellectual framework that is behind the and the ideas that are behind the design. But the process is extremely important. But I think we also don't talk about it much because sometimes the, you don't want to know the process, you know, because it's sometimes in your main if you think of Qatar or whatever. So um, there is there is something, I think, a female component in, in having the emphasis. Of course, not just women, but it would say really female. Also, also men can have this thing, of course. And I think this empathic part is something that is, is important. And, and of course, when you are on the site and when you live with the people and you see how they spend the daily money, you know, the wages that they get, and you see that they spend it in the vegetables of the neighbors or they get a new sari blouse and so on. So it's really something that the building is more than just a structure, is really a catalyst for the for the circular local economy. And that is something, you know, um, I think that is when you see how people develop and 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 flourish, you know, when you know communities are go feeling well is something I think, you know, that empowers you also and 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 kind of gives you good wind from the back to go on for the next project. And I think this is something, you know, the empathy is probably a female thing. I think uh, the way I would like to talk about the feminist aspect is the, the fact that uh, I don't think that I personally, uh, you know, now I'm raising one son and one daughter, you know, and I don't think that the sensitivity necessarily is a biological thing. Uh, of course, I, I agree with Anna's points, uh, what she mentioned, but I mean that it is a maybe the practice of raising people in a certain environment of discrimination that could make it look like a gender problem. And we don't know, there are experts out there who will know how much of it is biological and what is psychological and what was environment. My, I can only say from my own case that I do, I'm not sure if if women and men do different kinds of architecture and if I had a different kind of sexual organ, if I would do a different building, I'm not sure if that would be the case, you know. I think it's much more about whether 
I would, I mean, what, I mean, it, it, it's only a relevant topic, feminism, so long as there is discrimination. And that's not only with gender, that is with race and with everything else. When there's discrimination, there's a topic. When there would be equal, equal rights and all that established, we would equally be announcing, oh, there's a new prize for a male architect. We would not only use the adjective for the female. So I personally did not look for a role model with, by looking at their gender or anything, because I, growing up in a patriarchal society, I just felt like there were people's limiting beliefs in my society. I was very careful to not make those my own ones. So I never got reduced. So I just did everything. I had to pay a big price for it. I was driving a motorbike. I was going around in shorts. I was doing what I had to do, climb on the scaffolding. I knew there were, there's a price to be paid. And I'm today, have, I paid a huge price. I'm ready to pay double the price today. Now when I know, because that's the only way you, if you believe in something ought to be a certain way, I think I believe much more in quietly just doing it day by day by day, just doing it. And yes, there will be people who don't like you. And so what? I really love, I love the response to that and the answers. I mean, the way that you both communicate your passion for this is really, you can't see it, but is, is mimicked in the comments where people are just absolutely loving your enthusiasm and energy for your work and the passion is so clear. Um, so I'm just going to, we have a couple of minutes left. And um, at the moment, our, uh, the audience, we've sent people a few messages uh, in Hopin um, to certain people with questions to try and get them on screen. So if you keep a lookout, if for those of you who have been messaged, you should have an, an airplane in the top, a sort of paper airplane in your top right with a uh, red dot on it, which shows you that you've got a message. Um, we're really keen to try and get someone. Uh, so if anyone can find that, click on the link. We will see you in this back end. Um, but in the meantime, while people are looking and scrambling around, I have a question from Hattie Hartman, who, again, so I believe <laughs> has spoken to Anna. So our two questions yeah. have been from people who have already interviewed Anna Palmer and Anna. Um, and Hattie's question is, are you optimistic that your approach to architecture is starting to be more widely understood and accepted? Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, there, there is hope, I would say. I think, you know, that... Um, there's a big longing for doing meaningful architecture. And I think, you know, it's not enough to do good looking architecture anymore. We're tired of it. I mean, there are so many buildings that look good, but still, you know, it doesn't touch your heart. And I think there is really a longing for it. And you see it, especially at the universities. And it's just, you know, that there is probably not yet enough trust that you can make it um, in this economic system, you know, but I would say, you know, everyone, every student out there, just tr trust your heart, you know, and just go for it. And, and I think, you know, everyone is born with different talents and, and passions. And if you just do what you think you're born, you know, and you develop your talents and use it not just for yourself, but for also for the others, I think I, I really trust that, that life is opening doors for you and will also take care of you and, and you will get awards and, and, and things, you know, you will get the money from unexpected sources probably, but, but uh, yes, there is hope. I really, really strongly believe that. Yeah, I think I would say I'm optimistic, but um, my optimism is just a general state. It's, I don't know if it is a reflection of the outer circumstances. It's just because I feel I'm alive. I want to live a certain way. And I don't look for that validation, you know, from very early on, because I, like I said, I had operated in times where it was not accepted or many things were not accepted. I don't know whether it's the profession or whether just me being feeling free or I, I didn't even want to spend any minutes understanding what exactly they're not accepting and whoever it is. So I think when you're alive, you should just, um, you owe it to yourself. Like when a plant grows, it doesn't think whether it's growing on top of another one. It, they sort it out. Who's taking how much shade from whom, who's, you know, everyone who's born, has a right to be themselves, to develop their highest potential. And uh, if we are too preoccupied with what other people think about us, um, even if we get popular and all that, we may not be happy with the life we led. You know, it's very important not to fall into the trap of all that. And I think 
we i think the impact of my work because i'm a very slow kind of patient person i think it it from all the people i've seen earlier i've seen that their the real impact came later after 100 years after they died and all that so i'm not trying to first of all do it for the impact but if i live my life in a certain way and if it did have an impact somewhere it will have it whenever the time is ready you know how will it help if i change my action based on that so yes i think the question is important and uh, but i don't think we should even think about that because it may if the answer comes no you may feel like not doing it and don't even ask it and for me that real uh, confirmation of that optimism came because actually unlike anna i did not have i didn't receive that kind of any international awards and things like that or you know uh it louisiana museum is willing to put this kind of resources to show my work to others that means something i did was seen to be relevant you know and so then i feel okay you know th th that's one big step of feeling that um the processes have been understood maybe not yet the products Wow. This is <laughs> somehow somewhere give one a woman a word. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying you know what? It's not the reason to do a thing. Like who it makes a film to get an award, right? They just tell their story, and somebody gets something, and that's that's a very different other world, you know. Main thing is you should feel so good and rich about your life, right? You should like yeah. your job when you get up and go to work. Yes. So that's the main thing. Thank you so much for that. I think um, Hattie's question was quite a good one, perhaps to end on uh, in yeah. the end. And we have a little message from Alan uh, Alan Jones, um, who says, "Great advice. Be yourself. Be your best." Oh, self. lovely! And I think that's great to to end on. So, thank you so much to you both for tonight's event, for your generous conversation, and opening yourselves up for an event like this. And I'd also like to thank um, Shumi Bose for her question, but also her support early on in planning this event. Thanks again to our sponsors, uh, Beach Bathrooms, and everyone for joining. We have two more digital events lined up across the next two months. Hopefully, we'll have a, a sort of slide appearing shortly to show you, um, to direct you there. And we'll be releasing tickets for the rest of the series soon. And um, I'll paste a link in the chat so that you can find out more. Uh, in the meantime, do give the networking a go for the next 15 minutes or so and see what happens. I might see you there. Uh, but uh, thanks again, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining tonight. And we'll hopefully see you at the next one. Thank yes. You. Thank you so much. And Anna, let's talk. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Chloe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, I hope we get to see some of the chat comments. I don't know. Do we get to see them? Or I can send them to you. Would be nice just to... Uh, for everyone who took the effort to write to us that we can write if and, and otherwise we can connect on social media absolutely and, we'll forward those all to you because they are so okay. lovely thanks all lovely to yeah, have this special moment <laughs> anna yes. all the best <laughs>